Hi everyone, welcome to the Hope in Christ podcast, a weekly conversation following the Come Follow Me curriculum from the Church of Jesus Christ, where we dive deeper into the scriptures and use them as a launching pad for relevant conversations that help us all live Christ's gospel, survive living in the last days, rediscover how we fit into God's plan, and increase our hope and faith in Jesus Christ as we prepare the world for His return. I'm so glad you're listening, and sincerely hope you enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to the very first Come Follow Me episode of the Hope in Christ podcast. I mentioned in the bonus episode that released yesterday that this podcast was about to get so much better. We're going to start aligning these podcast conversations with the Come Follow Me curriculum for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so they're still going to be inspirational and uplifting and uh, and hopefully a highlight to your day, but we're going to align our conversations with topics and principles that are taught in the Come Follow Me lesson for that week. So this week, we're diving into section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And in the pattern of this podcast, In order to make this a relevant discussion, something you can apply and use in your life that's going to be meaningful to you, I'd like to start out with a couple of questions for you to think about. Have you ever felt felt yourself a little overwhelmed? Um, Think about areas of your life where you see that you could use some heavenly help or some, some strength and improvement. Now, don't spend too long thinking about this. If you're like me, you'll make a list that's just going to be overwhelming in itself. So just think for a second about maybe a time where you felt stressed out about raising kids in a dangerous world, or maybe you felt discouraged from time to time, and you just felt like you needed increased strength and power in your life. I remember sitting in a sacrament meeting as a young boy, hearing a a return missionary from my ward talk about his mission experiences and teaching people the gospel of Jesus Christ. And hearing him share stories of his mission really got me excited. And several years later, I sat in a high council room in my church building, surrounded by priesthood leaders from my stake, and I was there to report to them of my full-time missionary service over the last two years, serving in the uruguay Montevideo West mission. Now, if you've served a mission for the Lord, you know how hard it is to express in just a few words the feelings, emotions, and life-changing experience that it is to bring people to Christ and prepare the earth for His second coming. Hearing missionaries report on their service can have an influence on our vision, can help us see clearly what the Lord is doing on the earth today. When you're living as a missionary, you're kind of shutting out all of the other influences Uh, of the world, and you're focused and riveted on the Lord's work. And and sharing those stories can really help people um, feel the power of God on the earth. Now, this is similar to the setting for Doctrine and Covenants, section 84. Several elders who had been called earlier to serve as missionaries in the Lord's Restored Church were now reporting their missionary service to the prophet Joseph Smith. It was in that setting that Joseph inquired of the Lord, and he received the revelation we now call Section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, the prophet Nephi, when he saw our day in a vision, he described the saints living in the last days, and he used these words, It came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the Church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord who were scattered upon the face of all the earth. And they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. Now, think about those words. Armed with the power of God in great glory? There are some days when I wake up wondering where that power is because sometimes I just feel powerless and I need strength. To understand what Nephi was seeing and to uh, begin our study of Doctrine and Covenants 84, Let's take a minute and go back to the pre-mortal experience in our, in our conversation, our life before mortal birth. We know from Scripture that there were various groups of people in our Heavenly Father's family there. There existed a group of individuals the Scriptures have called noble and great and exceedingly faithful. They're also chosen because of their exceeding faith in Jesus Christ, or in Jehovah as he was known then. And individuals in this group, through their own choices over eons of living in and being reared by God's uh, loving presence, they had developed a propensity towards spiritual things. 
This group of individuals loved God, and they sought deeply to obey Him. God called this particular group of His children Israel, meaning God prevails, or let God prevail. They were called there to special purposes on this earth, and more particularly, they were called to be His covenant people, to receive the gospel in the flesh, and ultimately receive all that God has, including a life and existence like His in a glorified, resurrected body, filled with the fullness of His glory. And Paul touches on this in Romans. Chapter 8 of Romans says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Remember that group in the premortal life loved God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. So we're called to do His work. For whom he did foreknow, so he knew us there, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. So he has set us apart to be, if we choose in this life, changed to be like his Son. In verse 30 of chapter 8, it says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. So he's, he's forgiven us of our sins there in the premortal life. We know we were born innocent into this world. And he says, whom God has justified, he also glorified. And we know that as we kept our first estate, as, as it says in the book of Abraham, we chose to have faith in Christ there. We were added upon with glory, which is our physical body. And this will happen once again with a glorified resurrected body if we choose again to accept that call here in this life. In Ephesians, he goes on in this same uh, thread to say, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So that's saying that we were going to be adopted into the family of God, even though we're his spirit children, in the flesh, we're, we're, we're children of our parents here on earth, and we could once again be adopted into his holy family with a body through Jesus Christ. That comes through spiritual rebirth. So, and we'll, we'll get into that a little later in this conversation and in future discussions as we dive into Come Follow Me. So, this group of wonderfully faithful children of our Heavenly Father were sent to earth, called to receive the gospel in this life, if they chose to do so. And they were sent to earth to live a mortal experience in a fallen physical body with a soul, remember the soul is the body and the spirit, with a soul that now has a dual nature, a spirit that is divine, and a body that is mortally fallen and corrupt. This group called Israel was scattered throughout the families of the earth with the hope that they would influence the rest of the world and invite all to join Israel, join that group, and receive God's covenant promises in eternity. This group, now with a physical body, would need to prepare themselves to return to God forever, having become like Him at that point. An otherwise impossible task that would require a spiritual rebirth in the body that would allow us to become changed and ultimately sanctified in the body to once again become the sons and daughters of God, this time not just spirit sons and daughters of God, but also with a physical body. We call that, in the book of Abraham, it refers to it as the second estate. So because of Jesus Christ's atonement, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, a mighty change can take place in us, or in our hearts, that we have no more disposition or desire to do evil, but to do good continually. At that point, we're born again, Yea, born of God, the Book of Mormon teaches, changed from our carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness, being redeemed of God. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So with that backdrop and that foundation and understanding of this group of Israel who was called before they were born into this world, um, who now uh, must accept that call again in this life in order to receive the full covenants of our Heavenly Father, let's dive into section 84. In verse number 2 of section 84, the Lord begins by saying, The word of the Lord concerning His church established in the last days for the restoration of His people. So one of the reasons for his church to be restored in the last days is to restore his people. Remember, his people, 
he called Israel. So to restore that group, bring them back together and restore them. And he goes on to say, and for the gathering of his saints to stand upon Mount Zion, which shall be the city of New Jerusalem. So the Mount Zion is, an, is another symbol of the temple. So he wants his saints to be gathered into the temple to prepare them to receive Jesus Christ in the New Jerusalem at, at his second coming. So he then gives some direction in this section for the saints to build up that city of the New Jerusalem and the temple there in Missouri. Now, because of persecution, they were not able to build it at that time, but it will be built. Then, in the middle of speaking about that future day when the temple will be built, the Lord interjects that thought with a lesson about the priesthood. He explains that the priesthood Moses held was passed down from generation to generation through Abraham, Elchizedek, Noah, and Enoch, even until Adam. And that priesthood continues in God's church in all generations, and it has no beginning and no end. In that conversation, the Lord instructs us that there is the Melchizedek priesthood and there is the Aaronic priesthood, and we'll get to those a little later. And in verse 19, he says that this greater priesthood administereth the gospel and holdeth the key of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. So the word mystery in the New Testament signifies the religious things that are hidden from the wicked but revealed to the righteous and godly, those who had been initiated. Now think about the first ordinances of the endowment when you hear that word initiated. Also related to that same word in Greek is one um, is a word that means to shut one's mouth, giving the idea of silence once one is initiated into religious ordinances. So there's, there's meaning behind some of these words. Uh, he says also that it holds the key to the knowledge of God. Now that opens, the priesthood opens the door to know God. And you can't really know God simply by hearing about him. You know him by becoming like him and seeing him. And so the priesthood holds the key to becoming like God and to seeing him. In fact, it then tells us how the priesthood does this. Verse 20, therefore in the ordinances thereof, the ordinances of the priesthood, the power of godliness is manifest. The power of godliness. That's the power of God, but it's even more. It's the power of being godly, the power to become like him. That's the ultimate power of God is to change us, to help us become like him and give us everything that he has. Now, remember, as mortals, we possess a fallen nature that on its own is an enemy to God. We require a change. And we often call that a change of heart. Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles said this, The word heart is used over 1,000 times in the standard works. This simple but significant word often denotes the inner feelings of an individual. Our hearts, the sum total of our desires, affections, intentions, motives, and attitudes, define who we are and determine what we will become. And the essence of the Lord's work is changing, turning, and purifying hearts through gospel covenants and priesthood ordinances. We do not build or enter holy temples solely to have a memorable individual or family experience. That's important. Rather, the covenants received and the ordinances performed in temples are essential to the sanctifying of our hearts and for the ultimate exaltation of God's sons and daughters. That's the end of Elder Bednar's quote. This really is significant. Our hearts can be changed through these ordinances and covenants, not only in the temple, but also the ones that, that prepare us for the temple. So in Second Peter, Peter touches on this as well. He said, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby we're given, sorry, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by those you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So having escaped the natural man, that part of you that that just likes to do whatever you want to do, escaping that, you can partake of the divine nature. And this happens through godliness, through a knowledge of him. So by getting to know God. And, uh, you, you know, Joseph Smith once said that what was the object of gathering the people of God in any age of the world? 
He said the main object was to build unto the Lord a house whereby he could reveal unto his people the ordinances of his house and the glories of his kingdom and teach the people the way of salvation. For there are certain ordinances and principles that when they are taught and practiced must be done in a place or a house built for that purpose. So the purpose of the temple and all priesthood ordinances is to help bring us back into God's presence. This is done in a process. It's not a single event. It's not just a one-time thing. You go to the temple and you're done. Luckily, we have the, the Lord has de- designed his plan to allow us to go back to the temple. And though we're not making those covenants again for ourselves, we're, we're hearing them again and we're in his presence. We're being taught those things and we can renew them at the sacrament table. And we'll talk about that in a second. It involves being born again, born spiritually, so that the nature of our soul, our spirit and our body can become reconciled or one with God. In our natural mortal state, we are not prepared, you and I, and we're unworthy to enter into the, into the Lord's presence and receive the fullness of His glory. We have to be born again. We have to once again accept our calling to be among God's chosen people. Elder David A. Bednar went on to say, Holy ordinances are central in the Savior's gospel and in the process of coming unto him and seeking spiritual rebirth. Ordinances are sacred acts that have, been, that have spiritual purpose, eternal significance, and are related to God's laws and statutes. All saving ordinances and the ordinance of the sacrament must be authorized by one who holds the, requ- the requisite priesthood keys. The ordinances of salvation and exaltation administered in the Lord's restored church are far more than rituals or symbolic performances. Rather, they constitute authorized channels through which the blessings and powers of heaven can flow into our lives. So what is an ordinance? An ordinance is, as Elder Bednar said, a sacred action that has spiritual meaning. Priesthood ordinances are tied to covenants, promises with God. The physical action of the ordinance, sometimes even called a token, is meant to teach us about the covenant that we're entering into. The purpose of the ordinance is to help us better understand the covenant and get that covenant to sink deep into our hearts. I once heard President Russell M. Nelson teach that the covenant could be compared to medication that will help bring about a needed change in us. And the ordinance would then be the capsule that holds the medication. Its job is to get the medication to the place where it can make the biggest difference. So the ordinance, if we pay close attention, it can help take that covenant deep inside us to the place into our hearts where it will make the biggest difference. So how can we allow the actions or tokens of the ordinance to help us more deeply understand and internalize the covenants that we're making. Perhaps you've been to a baptism or to a sacrament meeting or even to the temple, and maybe once or twice you felt that you didn't understand exactly what was going on. Let's talk about how we can understand what's going on and how understanding that will help us internalize and really adopt that ordinance into our nature, into who we are, so that we become like our Heavenly Father through Christ. Pay particular attention to the actions of the ordinance. Prepare, before you go to participate in an ordinance, prepare your mind and your heart to participate in that ordinance, and then seek the help of the Holy Ghost as you look for spiritual meaning in the actions or tokens of the ordinances. Elder Bednar said, Ordinances that are received worthily and remembered continually open the heavenly channels through which the power of godliness can flow into our lives. Covenants that are honored steadfastly and remembered always provide purpose and the assurance of blessings in both mortality and for eternity. Now let me offer this piece of help and advice to you that may seem obvious to to some of you. 
the ordinances all make reference to our Savior Jesus Christ. There is no power in the actions of the ordinance or in the covenants themselves. The power is in Jesus Christ, and it comes to us through His Holy Spirit because of His grace and our willingness to keep our covenants with He and with our Heavenly Father. So, if you want to better understand the actions or tokens of the priesthood ordinances, study and ponder deeply about Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice. All of the ordinances and covenants point to him. He is our way to the Father. He is the one who becomes our spiritually our Father as we're spiritually reborn. He it is that, that these ordinances point to. And so, let's demonstrate how a few of the ordinances point us to Jesus Christ and help us internalize the covenant that we're making with God that does allow his power and grace to change us. So, in Romans chapter 6, speaking of baptism, Paul taught, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. The symbolism in baptism is beautiful. And there's another episode we did a few weeks back on the symbolic uh, nature of baptism. And that's a great shorter episode if you want to check that out. Uh, We go into a little more depth on this. But do you see how the symbols of baptism, where we are we're buried in the water, where we come forth out of the water, points us to the death and the resurrection of Christ. And it also reminds us that as we're entering into this covenant to love him and keep his commandments and serve him, that we are to let part of us die. Part of us needs to be buried in that water and stay there while the rest comes forth in a newness of life, as, as Paul taught. So we must let the natural man or woman inside of each of us die. Can you see how hard that could potentially become if we start to hold on to or even declare our own identity with labels that rise from our natural man? Ultimately, children of God is one label that we can safely carry with us into the presence of God as men and women who've mortified the deeds of the flesh and allowed our natural self to be crucified with Christ. There's a hymn called Nearer My God to Thee. You're probably familiar with this hymn. I love this hymn. It's interesting. It's actually written about Jacob's own experience with the priesthood ordinances at Bethel, which is Hebrew for the house of God. And I want to quote just a part of the first verse of this song. It says, Nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee, even though it be a cross that raiseth me. So, even though we are allowing part of us to be be lifted up on this cross and to die with Christ, our sins, that is, we're letting our sins, our natural man or woman, be nailed to the cross with Christ and, and die with him, we can let that go. We don't have to hold on to our sins anymore. We don't have to hold on to that imperfect part of us anymore because it died with him. Paul said that it was nailed to the, cro- to the cross. And so um, Christ took that up in, in his body in Gethsemane and then he died on the cross and those sins and imperfections died with him. We don't have to worry about those anymore. So the Holy Ghost can sanctify us and cleanse us as we increasingly receive his spirit. This is an ordinance of confirmation. In the temple, we're washed, anointed, and clothed 
as initial preparations to enter into God's presence. Now, just to give you an idea of what the Lord sees when he looks at these ordinances, in Doctrine and Covenants 36, he revealed a very poignant perspective. He said to Edward Partridge, I will lay my hand upon you by the hand of my servant, Sidney Rigdon, and you shall have my spirit, even the Holy Ghost. So, to God, he sees ordinances as an opportunity for him to lay his hands on us. It is truly where heaven and earth meet, and as we're touched by the divine, we're changed. Ordinances leave us elevated to a higher level. Ordinances, and the temple where ordinances take place, is where the divine can touch the undivine and and change them. So, the privilege, this is, I have to read this, this is from Truman Madsen. I love um, Brother and Sister Madsen. The privilege of attending the house of God is in effect to have our physical beings brought into harmony with our spirit personalities. And I have read the testimony of President Lorenzo Snow to the effect that participating in the temple ceremonies is the only way that the knowledge locked in one's spirit can become part of this flesh. Thus occurs that inseparable union, that blending, which makes possible a celestial resurrection. It is as if I may mix the figure, we're given in the house of God a patriarchal blessing to every organ and attribute and power of our being, a blessing that is to be fulfilled in this world and the next, keys and insights that can enable us to live a godly life in a very worldly world, protected, even insulated from the poisons and distortions that are everywhere. We are instead to proceed to watch and pray. Our bodies may be developed into the very likeness of our spirits, which are divine, and ultimately then become, as it were, a product of another birth, through which Jesus becomes, in the process of ordinances, our Father. I love how he puts that so beautifully said. And so, ordinances in the temple, as Brother Madsen says, is almost like a patriarchal blessing to every organ and attribute and power of our being. God touching us and giving to us part of his power, part of his perspective. These are physical ordinances. They have spiritual meaning. President Russell M. Nelson said, the temple is literally full of truth. Truths of the Father's plan are laid open to us with clarity and power. Words of truth about our Father, His Son, and their relationship to us are spoken in the covenants and ordinances of the temple. The temple is a house of revelation, where truth distills upon our souls and enlightens our understanding. We learn of our eternal identity and purpose and the marvelous promises of the Lord. Those promises are true, for our God is a God of truth and cannot lie. If our brothers and sisters go to the temple seeking strength and understanding, they will be taught by the Lord himself about truths that matter most to them in their time of need. You see, we don't go to the temple and get taught by an instructor who stands before us and explains all the symbolism of the temple and all of the mysteries of God. No, these things are taught to us by God himself. They're reserved for him to teach us, and he he teaches them to us at our level. Depending on how prepared you and I are each time we go to the temple or to the sacrament table, we'll determine how much he's able to teach us, how much we're able to learn. So the more prepared we are, the more frequently we attend, the more we will be learning and the more power we will be obtaining. God reveals the principles of exaltation in the temple through ordinances consisting of washings, anointings, clothing, the priesthood endowment, and marriage for eternity. Don't take those ordinances for face value. There is so much more to them than first meets the eye. Sometimes I wonder if we get so used to hearing our leaders tell us everything we need to know that we begin to stop searching and studying and pondering as much as we ought to. When it comes to priesthood ordinances, and particularly those of the temple, if we're not preparing our minds and our spirits before we attend, and if we're not attending regularly, 
And if we're not looking and listening to the promptings of the Spirit, asking the Lord questions, and then seeking out the answers in prayer and study and careful pondering, it's possible that we will miss out on some of the significant lessons being taught in the temple and some of the power that could come to us through our covenants. Remember, the ordinances are meant to help take those covenants deep inside of us. For example, in the temple, verbally, we're taught relatively little about the temple garment. But if we search the scriptures and listen closely to the words of the temple endowment, certain questions might begin to come to our mind. For example, we know that Adam and Eve were both clothed by the Lord in sacred clothing. But if we ponder this truth, other questions might surface, such as, where did that garment likely come from? How is that symbolic? And how does it point them to the Savior? What significance, then, does the temple garment have for me? What power can come to me as I understand answers to these questions and clothe myself in the temple garment every day? How does understanding these beautiful and sacred truths increase my appreciation for the temple garment? And will this change the way I honor the sacred privilege it is to prioritize how often I will choose to wear the temple garment in my daily activities? See, as we ponder those questions and questions like those, and we seek insight from the influence of the Holy Ghost, we will learn so much more about the symbolic meaning of priesthood ordinances, and thus we will understand much more about the covenants that we're making and receive more of God's power in our life that is being extended to us if only we will be open to receive, to ask, to seek. Because of the sacred nature of temple ordinances, and their ability to reveal to us the mysteries and truths of God. We do not go to the temple where an instructor lays out all of Heavenly Father's mysteries and everything we need to know. We also don't hear these things taught from the pulpit at general conference or in sacrament meetings. That is because it is the role of the Holy Ghost to teach us those things. He reveals them to us as we actively prepare, ask, seek, and keep our covenants. The Lord will teach us through His Spirit at our level. Wherever we are in our life, we can be taught in the temple in a way that is applicable to us at that time. Speaking of this rebirth that takes place through priesthood ordinances, Elder Bednar taught, We are commanded and instructed to so live that our fallen nature is changed through the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. President Marion G. Romney taught that the baptism of fire by the Holy Ghost converts us from carnality to spirituality. It cleanses, heals, and purifies the soul. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, and water baptism are all preliminary and requisite to, and prerequisite to it, but the baptism of fire is the consummation. To receive this baptism of fire is to have one's garments washed in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Hence, as we are born again and strive to always have His Spirit to be with us, the Holy Ghost sanctifies and refines our souls as if by fire. Ultimately, we are to stand spotless before God. That's the end of his quote. So as we increase our commitment to God and rivet our focus and priorities on spiritual things, He can increasingly reveal truths to us in the temple and endow us with greater power, His power, power to be like Him, And as we increasingly become like him, we have the power we need to overcome the world. In Doctrine and Covenants section 63, the Lord said that as we keep his commandments, and as he reveals to us the mysteries of his kingdom, that knowledge will become in us a well of living water, springing up unto everlasting life. We'll be filled. No longer will we thirst. No longer will we be in need or search of worldly things to satisfy our need to belong, or to fit in, or our need for validation or acceptance. No more will we seek the temporary pleasure of attention, or riches, or fame, or anything offered to us by a world that's so obsessed with itself. Because we will have within us a well of water that always leaves us filled, at peace, 
and completely and permanently filled with everlasting joy. We will have a complete sense of belonging and confidence and selfless love in the presence of God. Now, in verses 23 to 30, the Lord instructs us that Moses sought to sanctify his people and to bring them into the presence of God. But because of sin and mixed up priorities, falling to worldly pleasures and focuses, they chose not to enjoy the blessings of sanctification, and they chose ultimately not to enter into God's presence. They were then given the Aaronic priesthood and the law of Moses rather than the law of Christ. This would focus their efforts more on obedience to rules in hopes of preparing the people to receive principles. This reminds me of an experience I had as a missionary. Um, I know you love to hear that phrase, right? This reminds me of my mission. Um, when I re- when I arrived at my mission, I sensed that there were some obedience problems uh, in the past. Uh, I heard lots of stories. Um, and I remember the first zone conference we had, um, the topic was faith. It was a beautiful lesson taught by my mission president. About a year or two later, toward the end of my mission, I remember my mission president uh, talking to me about his experience there. And he, he had arrived there one year before I had. So my first zone conference was his uh, one-year mark in the mission. And he told me that it was in such disarray when he got there as far as certain elders just doing weird and strange and walking in strange paths and kind of walking into large and spacious buildings. Um, And he said that he had to focus every single zone conference on the same topic. He said that for the first year, every zone conference, the discussion was obedience. It was kind of like the law of Moses. We're, We're just going to talk about the rules. Let's talk about obedience. He mentioned that after a year of talking about obedience, he felt comfortable and impressed to move to the topic of faith, which was my first zone conference when I'd arrived. The Lord did the same thing with the Israelites. He focused on obedience. He gave them this carnal law of obedience, uh, the law of Moses. Rather than teaching them principles, he thought that teaching them about obedience to rules would prepare them to receive principles where they could use their agency and then go and, and do these things based on principle. Do you ever find yourself wishing that everything could just be spelled out? I've heard people say things like that before. Just tell me what I should or shouldn't do to get to heaven. We sometimes run into this issue with media, like movies or apps or games or music and websites. Just tell me which ones I shouldn't look at which ones shouldn't I download, and which ones can I look at? Or maybe with the Sabbath day, you've heard people say, uh, just give me a list of the things that we should do on Sunday and the things we shouldn't. It's just so much easier that way. Well, that's exactly what he gave the Israelites who refused to come into his presence, the ones who were not ready to receive the full blessings of Heavenly Father and the fullness of his power. So they were cursed with this lesser law of Moses, these, a list of to do's and don'ts, to lift them from a level of disobedience and wickedness associated with maybe the telestial glory, to a level of obedience and righteousness relative maybe to a terrestrial glory, to a point where they would be prepared. If they could master the law of Moses, they'd be prepared to receive celestial principles and become perfected and sanctified through Christ's atonement and living the law of Christ, which is a principle-based law. So the Lord doesn't work that way uh, so much with us. He doesn't give us the law of Moses. Um, Joseph Smith taught, if you wish to go where God is, you must be like God or possess the principles which God possesses. So we've got to receive those principles. So instead of the do's and the don'ts, Jesus Christ taught principles during his mortal ministry when he raised the bar from the law of Moses to the law of Christ or the law of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Principles of faith, repentance, obedience, sacrifice, chastity, living in such a way that you consistently receive the influence and sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost, as well as principles of you know, sexual purity and consecration. When you think of ordinances, even those of the temple, these principles should sound familiar. Each of these principles are laws we covenant to live. We promise to take them inside ourselves and through the grace of Christ and a determined commitment to live them, these principles become part of us. And like Joseph Smith taught, we begin to possess these principles that enables us then to go where God dwells and to be like God is. In verses 31 and 32 of section 84, 
The Lord said that in the very last days, those who hold the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods will offer up a sacrifice to the Lord and right in, in the temple. And we'll touch on that in a future section of the Doctrine and Covenants. In verse 33, we begin to enter into what is referred to as the oath and covenant of the priesthood. This is an oath from our Heavenly Father to His faithful children, promising them everything He has. Because that promise is applicable to both men and women, we will look at this oath and covenant as it applies to all of God's faithful children. Though much of the time, emphasis on this oath and covenant is specifically focused on those ordained to priesthood office. Let's read first in verse number 33. For whoso is faithful unto the obtaining these two priesthoods, of which I have spoken, and the magnifying their calling, are sanctified by the Spirit unto the renewing of their bodies. So he says obtaining the priesthood, not necessarily by ordination to office, but it can also be seen as obtaining the ordinances of those priesthoods. As we discussed earlier, all of Heavenly Father's exceedingly faithful children were called, and as Peter put it, predestinated, to receive the gospel after leaving our pre-mortal home. That didn't guarantee our salvation to celestial glory, but rather promised us that we would have the blessings necessary to obtain it if we choose to, to ex- exercise faith again in this world. In the book of Abraham, it's called keeping our second estate. We chose Christ once, and now with the added glory and complexity of a physical and fallen mortal body, we must again use our agency to choose him again. To accept our calling is to live his gospel and be his disciples, to gather and love and care for his other children in this life. So it says in verse 33 that if we receive or obtain the priesthood, and magnify our calling, remember that calling that we were called to before this world was, we can be sanctified. If we magnify and accept our calling, we can become holy. That's what saint means. The root for saint is holy. We become saints, and unto the renewing of our bodies. So this, as a lot of our Heavenly Father's promised blessings, has ramifications not only in the resurrection and in eternity, but also now in our life. Have you ever walked away from the temple or from the Sabbath day feeling empowered and strengthened, even renewed physically? What about a time in your life when you were overwhelmed with so much to do, planning and executing a stake or ward youth conference or a youth camp while also volunteering at the local school or in your community with a thousand other things to do at home? Have you noticed that when you leave time to focus on spiritual things, on prayer, scripture study, temple worship, and service to people in need, the Lord seems to sustain us. Sure, we're tired, but have you noticed that he can offer strength and the ability to run on less sleep in those crazy times? There are moments in our life when this physical renewal can be experienced to strengthen us even now. I think back to when our children were were newborns, and I watched my, my wife and when my younger brother and sister, who are twins, were babies, and I watched my mother, and how exhausted they can be, but yet they continued to have strength. They were sustained in those times, um, physically as well as spiritually. The oath and covenant of the priesthood also includes the promise that as we magnify our calling to serve the Lord in whatever calling we have as members of His church or in other formal and ward and state callings, that and all of those, by the way, are issued, issued to us through priestly keys, that we become the sons of Moses and of Aaron and the seed of Abraham, the church and kingdom and elect of God. We become elected to receive eternal life. In verses 35 to 39 um, comes the covenant that if we receive the blessings, the ordinances and covenants of the priesthood, and we receive the servants of God, now remember, that's sustaining the prophets. And uh, that means even when you disagree with them. They are the Lord's anointed servants, and they are, there are serious and eternal ramifications for not aligning with the holy prophets of God. But if we receive them, and we receive the Lord himself, and we receive the Father and all the Father has, even receiving the fullness of his glory, 
all that he is, all that he enjoys, all that he creates. And this we have as an oath from God the Father himself. What a promise. These promises are also similarly outlined in section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where we learn of eternal marriage, which is the capstone ordinance of the priesthood, wherein we're ultimately eligible to receive the fullness of the priesthood and the promises of our Heavenly Father's oath and covenant. Now, the rest of this section expounds upon the purpose of the Lord's restored church to gather Israel and invite all to let God prevail in their life by accepting the fullness of the gospel and our responsibility as members of the church to open our mouths and act in loving, sharing, and inviting all to come unto Christ. In verses 44 to 46, he issues the command to live by every word of God, tells us that all truth emanates from Christ, and that all men, women, and children in this world are given the light and truth of Jesus Christ. We call this in part our conscience, and that anyone who will follow the promptings of the Spirit will be enlightened. In verse 52, the Lord offers us a great insight and tells us that as we work to gather Israel or those who want to let God prevail and have access to eternal joy, we will recognize them because they will know his voice. And he said that those who do not receive his voice aren't acquainted with him. They don't know him. Um, But those who were part of Israel before, they do know him. And those that want to join Israel now will will recognize his voice. So our job as members of Christ's church is not to convert the entire world, but rather to give people an experience with spiritual things so that they and we can recognize if they want to choose, whether they're choosing again or choosing for the first time, to become part of Israel, part of that group that loves God and really, really wants to let him prevail in their lives and be on the winning team in this mortal spiritual war. Now, in verses 57 and 58, we read that this takes place as we study and live the teachings of the Book of Mormon. And verse 61 says that we're to bear testimony to all the world of these things. Later on in verse 85, we receive the promise that if we will treasure up in our minds continually the words of life, when we open our mouths, the right words will come out. That are just exactly what each person needs to hear. And another great promise in verse 88 says that whenever we are received, the Lord will be there with us. As good as we are, the Lord knows that in order for his children to be gathered, his spirit and his angels are needed in this great work. And luckily, he has quite a few of these stalwart angels on the other side of the veil who he promises to send. He said, I will go before your face. I will be on your right hand and on your left. And my spirit shall be in your hearts and mine angels round about you to bear you up. And then in a majestic way, the Lord goes on in this revelation to speak of the winding up scene. He said in verse 96 that the nations of the earth will be scourged for their wickedness and plagues shall go forth and the houses of those who reject him shall be left desolate and he'll rend their kingdom. In Daniel 2, God said he'll set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, which shall consume all other kingdoms and stand forever. And he will continue to plague the nations and not only shake the earth, but the starry heavens shall tremble. And he'll also continue his work of righteousness to build temples, to send missionaries and to sanctify the saints until he has completed his work, until all shall know me who remain even from the least unto the greatest, he said, and shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord and shall see eye to eye and shall lift up their voice and together sing this new song. And the words to that song are these, The Lord hath brought again Zion. The Lord hath redeemed his people Israel according to the election of grace which was brought to pass by the faith and covenant of their fathers. The Lord hath redeemed his people, and Satan is bound, and time is no longer. The Lord hath gathered all things in one. The Lord hath brought down Zion from above. The Lord hath brought up Zion from beneath. The earth hath travailed and brought forth her strength, and truth is established in her bowels, and the heavens have smiled upon her, and she is clothed with the glory of her God, for he stands in the midst of his people. Glory and honor and power and might be ascribed to our God, 
for he is full of mercy, justice, grace, and truth and peace forever and ever. Amen. That might be the most beautiful song I have ever heard. I can't wait to hear Mac Wilberg write a score for that song and hear the Tabernacle Choir sing it and have us join in. I don't know if that's how it'll happen, but I just I just cannot wait until we get to sing that song. And I just can't imagine what uh, a beautiful melody will, will carry us through that song. That will be a day to live for. The Lord ends this revelation in section 84 with these words. For I, the Lord, have put forth my hand to exert the powers of heaven. You cannot see it now. Yet a little while, and you shall see it. And know that I am, and that I will come and reign with my people. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. My friends, if you are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we invite you to join us. And if you are part of the House of Israel and members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, remember the power of God that is accessible to you through the ordinances of the priesthood. Draw on that power. Prepare every week, every day of every week, to partake of the sacrament ordinance that promises the power to sanctify your soul, your body, and your spirit. Set aside time regularly and often if possible to participate in the glorious ordinances of the temple and seek out the meaning of those covenants as you watch and participate with alert minds in the tokens or actions of those sacred moments when you can be touched by the divine and receive of his power and of his vision for you and for your life and then walk away from those ordinances washed, anointed, clothed in his power with the promise of sanctification as you prepare to enter into the rest of the Lord. Thanks for listening in today and for taking the time to subscribe and share this with the people you love. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. You can also find videos of this podcast on YouTube at Hope in Christ Podcast or connect with me on Instagram at Peterson. Remember, there is always hope in Christ.